Arlington. It's been really exciting. This is one of our bigger events. We have 15 teams participating today, so looking forward to the excitement. We actually have two events happening this weekend at um, Washington, D.C. So as you all know, we've kind of expanded beyond the Texas area, and uh, we're excited to see the highlights from all of those and the winners coming back for the championship event on December 3rd. So I've been saying this every time some of you are coming back here for second events, but uh, this is my favorite season of the year. We got Christmas, we got Thanksgiving, and we've got the AVR competition. Yeah. 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 And what kind of a trifecta is that? It's really fun. So, you know, my favorite time is looking at all the designs here. Um, we've had so many phenomenal, um, innovative approaches for, for the taking on the challenge. We're going to see more of that today. So, excited to see that all come together. So, I'll already want to recognize how this all comes together. So, I've had the privilege over the last six years of developing this competition along with a host of other engineers who have really brought this to, to fruition. So, if you go to the next chart, um, we've got Bell, obviously, is the founding sponsor for this competition, but the game changer was when we connected up with the REC Foundation and they've helped us to grow this competition, do all the logistics and you interface with them. I think the fact that we have the forum this year has been phenomenal as far as you all interfacing with all the other teams and with our Bell engineers and the REC engineers. So that um, hopefully has been very helpful for you to develop your capabilities to compete. We've got drone blocks and robots that have been tremendous support for this competition. And then we added the Flying Our Labs for Lance Rodell, who's just provided a lot of the cool technology that we have on the drone this year that he provided. Um, <coughs> and then we've got a lot of sponsorships that have really gotten behind this. They see the benefit for, for them and for us, and so we really appreciate all of that. So, um, you know, one of the challenging things about this competition is there's so much um, technology that we have. I think it's beyond any other competition out there for high schoolers. And one of the things that we really want to give you is the experience of interfacing with Bell engineers so that they can inspire you, you can be inspired by them. And for that reason, I wanted to kind of expose you to some of our leadership at Bell and understand why they think this is a significant thing for us as a company. So I'm happy to have Jason Hirsch come up. He is our new Executive Vice President over all of engineering. Um, before that, he was a VP of Innovation. So he fully understands the challenges of what innovation requires, which is what you all have been right in the midst of. So Jason, would you come up and share some of your thoughts? They didn't warn me that uh, there was going to be a 10 foot tall picture of myself on there, so sorry if that's here. If anybody wasn't awake, uh, maybe you are now. So, um, I wanted to give a little bit of intro to Bell Engineering. Um, from the innovation perspective, uh, we've, we've launched a lot of new concepts, a lot of new technology beyond just the traditional helicopters over the last couple of years, and proud to have a lot of the team here today uh, to transfer uh, some of that knowledge over to you. Um, Appreciate UTA being host. I actually have been to UTA before. I think my SAT is here many, many moons ago. Um, I'm a local uh, local high school graduate, and uh, it's good to be back here. Also was able to come back um, virtually for a master's degree in engineering management from UTA, and so appreciate them being, uh, being partners as part of this. To me, the most important part of this is the hands-on learning that you get from doing the competition. It's a lot different than classroom and theoretical. Um, I, I always said, you know, especially as we go through, you know, flight tests, gearbox tests, all the things we do back at Bell, that it's always good to have, you know, dirt, oil, grime on your fingernails. I don't know what the, you know, software and electrical version of that is. I'm, I'm a gearhead by trade, but I, I think you get the idea. Um, my mentor at Bell uh, was a UTA grad um, and was a co-op during his time in college. And he always shared with me that the most, the most important lessons that he learned at Bell, he was able to, uh, 
bring back here to school and understand where to focus his studies, where to concentrate, and it really made it a, a lot more of a, um, you know, relational learning to where he, he was able to, to take that with him for life, and, uh, and it was a really big help. So, um, in the vertical lift industry, uh, we're really experiencing kind of a second golden age. I mean, if you look, there was a time period where we got done like three rotorcraft manufacturers in the U.S. <laughs> there, there's now about 300 new ones that have been registered on evtel.com. So th this is, um, I would say this is not a drill. This is just a step in that direction as we get into more complex systems of systems. And what has really happened is we've got into more digital flight controls, electric propulsion, things like that that are happening now. Uh, it's created a more complex ecosystem, and I, I don't know where Nick is in here, but he's trying to model all that for us so we understand what do the helicopters of the future look like. Um, this is a really good real-world test. It's not just a, an abstract, you know, move an object from here to here for no particular reason. Um, vertical lift is complex. Um, it's, it's a challenging way to fly. It's very power-intensive, very power-hungry. But if you look, the missions that rotorcraft fly are all extreme cases. You know, you don't see mass transit yet uh, with rotorcraft, but if you have somebody on the side of a mountain that there's no other way to get to them, then we bring this in. If you have, you know, forest fires in remote, remote areas and no other vehicles can actually even get to, then helicopters come in. Um, similar with, with military applications, with uh, you know, helicopter EMS when nobody can get there in time to, to save lives in, in a critical period of time. So it, it, it's really a project that Every mission we fly, there's an there's a extreme reason that gives our workforce a lot of passion uh, to work on it. Um, I'd be remiss for not mentioning that there's a um, kind of a revolution overturn of a lot of the rotorcraft that are flying today are 30, 40 years old. There's kind of a second period of, of rebirth, especially with the U.S. Army modernizing their fleet. Um, the Army buys new helicopters every 40 years or so, whether, whether they need to or not. And so we're on, we're on the cusp of within the, the next couple weeks uh, finding out if anybody's seen Black Hawk Down, that's the that's the aircraft that's going to be replaced. And so we're really going to at Bell, we're really going to be entering into a phase of heavy engineering work over the next five to ten years, where we've been in more of a more of a manufacturing phase. Uh, so if you have any questions about that, talk to the, the guys with the Bell staff shirts uh, while you go through the competition today. So um, the last thing I was going to say, um, I got a call I don't know, nine months or so ago from Ron saying, "Hey, I've got some ideas of what this is going to look like this year." Uh, Chad Sparks was on there too, and they were talking about the, the complexity of the scenario they were thinking about doing for this, uh, you know, multimodal firefighting mission. And I was like, that sounds really wild. How are you all actually going to do that? So it was great to see it in, in person this morning. Um, Ron's kind of set a high bar, and I'm really interested to see what he what he comes up with for next time to, to one up himself because you know the competition's been growing year after year. And so wish you all luck today. Hope to see you all in Arlington in the finals in a couple weeks. And we will reveal next year's at the championship round, so I'm looking forward to sharing that with you. All right, so I'll, we also have the privilege of having Dan Mance here, the CEO of RAC Foundation, and I'd like to have Dan go up and just give us a few thoughts on his perspective on this competition and just where we hope to go with it. So, Dan. <laughs> Foundation Robotics Education and Competition <coughs> Foundation, uh, we're probably best known for our Dutch Robotics competitions, but we do so much more. And about two years ago, I had the opportunity to meet uh, Ron for the first time, and uh, uh, I thought what he was proposing was amazing, and I saw so, so many opportunities for it. So I went back and told my staff, I said, hey, we're going to partner with Bell on this thing. And uh, um, last year, we learned a lot. Uh, we focused just on Texas and got over 50 teams. And then as soon as last year's event was over, Ron, myself, and a couple other people met and were like, we're going to expand. We're going to go to three states. And the REC Foundation um, is about inspiring students to work hands-on robotics. And it's also about the design process. And we took a strategic uh, major step forward. Right? We really pushed the envelope. And as part of pushing the envelope, we had some issues when we first launched the game this year. So not sure if anybody's at the Austin event. Um, but you all have received the updates to the game manual, and that's part of the learning process. Um, but I think the changes that we made after seeing the first event in Austin to simplify it a little bit um, actually makes the game better. And 
Um, super excited for y'all to get out there. You don't want to hear me talk much longer because you're probably anxious to see how your uh, your drones and, and securities do putting out fires. Um, but I, you know, I want to say as the CEO of the RIC Foundation, you know, we didn't intend to do changes to the game. You know, two thirds of the way through the, the design process, but that is what engineering is. It is actually. Um, experiencing failures and overcome failures and I'm very very proud of my team I'm very very proud of the Bell engineers and I'm very very proud of this community for understanding that and I think you're gonna have a lot of fun today um, and, and final I think this is you know year six of this competition the, the second year with the RIC foundation there is nothing like this in the world I mean this is one of the most unique unique programs that I have ever seen. I am so excited about it. I really do see a day when this is as big as, as the VEX Robotics competitions and FIRST and, and MATES, you know, all those other competitions out there. And you guys are getting in on the ground floor. So um, I'm really happy I have REC Foundation staff here. Um, you have Bobby sitting right there. She's one of our Texas people. Um, you have Daniel and you have Diana sitting over there. So I'll be here a little bit this morning. Um, I'd love to get feedback, but throughout the course of the day, um, if you can tell us what your experiences are, both good and bad, um, we learn from the bad and what we can do better because I think next year is going to be even bigger and better. So again, have a great time today. Thank you for being part of this program and uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. So thanks. Just recognize all the teams that are here. So Adrian Emerson is going to come up to be your MC for the day, and she's very familiar with the competition. She was a mentor last year for one of the teams. So as she announces you, we want you to stand up and show us that we uh, that you're excited about today. So good morning, Bell VRC. Are you guys awake this morning? Yeah. Are you ready to fly some drones today? Yeah. Definitely ready to see some drone action today. I was here last weekend and let me tell you, it was so exciting all day long, but I know that all of the teams here are gonna bring it even better than they did last weekend. Who here is competing for the second time this season? Uh, give me some cheers, let me see. Now, who here is competing for the first time this season? to have your drones take the stage for the first time today. So let's introduce our teams for today. Like Ron said, when you hear your team, please stand up so everybody can recognize you um, in this arena. So let's give everybody a good cheer, a good round of applause uh, when their team is announced. Uh, so let's get started. First, we have team 1004A Panthers from Fort Worth, Texas. Next up, we have Team 1019A, uh, Belina Etcher from Crowley, Texas. <laughs> guys. Uh, next up, we have Team 1020A, Cyber Wolves from Little Elm, Texas. <laughs> next, we have Team 1029A YHSDR1 from El Paso, Texas. <laughs> and that gives you guys a little extra encouragement. They actually traveled the farthest to get to this competition. It's still in the state of Texas. Next we have team 1033A, not very far behind them in second place for the team that traveled the furthest to get here, uh, Pesos Robotic from Pesos, Texas. <laughs> Next up we have team 1034A, Airship Academy, Rockwell, Texas. <laughs> Next up, we have Team 1037A Raider Drone Robotics from Dallas, Texas. From the best 
City and Texas Team 1043A Turbulence from Emerson, Texas. <laughs> All right, next up we have Team 1052A, Rio Vista Soaring Eagles from Rio Vista, Texas. And our only team here that is not from the state of Texas, Team 1055A, Region 5 STEM from Lake Charles, Louisiana. from right here in Arlington, Texas. <laughs> Next up, Team 1358 Eaton Eagles from Hazlitt, Texas. And then last but certainly not least, let's hear it for Team 4718A Mineral Wells Rams from Mineral Wells, Texas. talking about how awesome you teams are and, and watching the action from the field. Uh, please come and say hi to me, and I cannot wait to see all these runs in actions today. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Bobby uh, to go over some logistics for today. <coughs> Alrighty, I cannot believe they're going to make me follow her up today. Alright, we're going to go over the agenda and a couple of important reminders for today. Um, our safety inspections are going to take place immediately following our opening ceremonies. After I talk about some things, um, we're going to have some game updates and then you guys will do your safety inspections. Matches are scheduled to start at 9.45. We might be starting a little bit late depending on how long this takes. But um, as long as you all are queuing up about five minutes ahead of time, we'll try and make sure that we can make up on that time and uh, get things rolling. We'll have a lunch break at noon where I believe we are providing pizza for you all. Um, and then go back to matches at 1 o'clock and then conclude with our award ceremony at 5 p.m. Um, to recognize a couple of our rock star important volunteers, we have our head referee for today, that is Jeremiah. Yes! For our other field referees, if you all could stand, we have Elizabeth. that you know what matches that we are at and what matches are about to start. 
So if you are on time, we can make sure to make up some time if we lose that. Um, every team will get four matches today in one presentation. As a reminder, your uh, lowest scoring match will be dropped. And so it will, your final score for the day will be your three top matches and your presentation score, and that will determine our final rankings. Um, the way that that works on our pit display is it will show your highest ranking until you have three matches. So after you do your second match, it's only going to show your top highest match because it's already dropping that lowest score. So as we go throughout the day, you'll start to see those points add up after you hit your third and fourth match. Um, for our match period time, you'll have three minutes to set up, and immediately following those three minutes, you will have a five minute match time, and then immediately following that, you will have two minutes to clean up your robots, clean up your drones, uh, maybe we are dislodging them from the net in some way. <laughs> Had that yesterday, hopefully not today. Maybe pulling them out from the top of the netting, get the ladder up there, you know, fun stuff. Um, but that's gonna be kind of our cycle time. Um, so, you know, please be mindful of that. If you're not done setting up at that three minutes, that five minute match is going to start regardless of if you are done setting up or not. So try and get your robots set up and ready to go. Um, both fields will be running at the same time. So please be aware of your match schedule if you are on field one or field two. And as always for safety, please unplug your FPV while you are in the pit area. And speaking of safety, um, we've got <coughs> some pretty powerful drones going on here. So please always have safety glasses if you are at the field. Um, you will not be able to stand by the field if you do not have safety glasses. We had a few instances where rotors popping off, going flying. We want to keep you all as safe as possible. So you must have safety glasses when uh, you are at the field competing. Also, you guys have been awesome. I don't think I see, it'll be awkward if there are, but I don't see any rotors on any of these drones up here. Um, so as a reminder, please keep, if you have your batteries connected, propellers need to be off. If you have your propellers on, battery needs to be disconnected because again, these are some very powerful drones and we want to keep you all as safe as possible. Um, Please do not leave your battery unattended while charging. And then we also have fire blankets and um, fire extinguishers available at our tables in the competition area. Uh, as a reminder for our awards today, we will be giving out best overall design. Um, we will be giving out awards for exemplary teams, uh, our number one presentation, and then also the judges' choice awards. And then again, uh, we'll be giving out first, second, and third, which is the combination of your three highest scores along with your presentation award. And first place overall, we'll be heading to the championship. And with that, I will hand it over to Jeremiah for some of our important game updates. Yeah. Good morning. Bobby mentioned, uh, you know, obviously there's been a number of game updates. We, you know, aim to simplify the objectives to a certain degree. So, you know, there's going to be some uncertainties coming into your first matches, and maybe throughout the day you have questions that center around either the gameplay or approach or scoring. Uh, you know, I, I will for sure avail myself to you. Please feel free to come up and ask me questions throughout the day, between matches, during matches. Um, and uh, I think largely what, you know, the spirit of our game and kind of the objectives around this game as it originated have largely gone unchanged. Uh, you know, you're still fighting fires with your ABR drone, you're still using your support crew uh, on the dormant side to uh, check off objectives, and you're going to ideally progress through phases one, two, and three. Uh, the support actions that we're going to get into in the next slides have, have adjusted a little bit and as far as how the approach is with our ABR drone, um, because of the changes to the uh, space have, have uh, simplified things for you as well. So, uh, in the original game manual there was laser targets that were on multiple sides of buildings. Uh, we have adjusted and moved all windows and laser targets to the front side of the building. So if you can envision this from the fire station, staring either left or right uh, in your <coughs> arena, all laser targets are gonna be on the front side of the buildings. So if you have a closed roof building that you are using your laser water cannon to try to put out the fire with, uh, you're gonna be shooting it from the center of the field 
and your feedback and your visual feedback is going to be through the windows, but primarily through these LEDs that we have mounted on the front, on the front face of the buildings. As you can see in the picture here to the right, we're calling them gutters. And this, this picture is showing kind of a current maximum fire score. And you can also see your active windows. <coughs> So just updates for phase one. Obviously one community is going to begin burning and one will be dormant. Yeah. You as your, your teams are going to have the option to pick which direction you want to go. So with four matches, you have the option to go left to start out twice, and you have and then you'll go right to start out twice. So at the start of the match, a few things, right? Your hotspot is still going to turn on in one of your two tall buildings and it'll begin heating up. This is during the setup period. Okay, so once you go into your arena and start setting up your drones and placing them around your fire station, uh, there's gonna be a hot spot that'll start heating up on one of the buildings. This obviously behaves the same way, and if it's not clear before a minute, it'll erupt into a, into a fire uh, at, the, at the start, at the one minute mark of that match. At that, okay, sorry. sorry. So the two of the short buildings will begin burning with one of the active windows, and then, as you saw on the last slide, your second window will come on at that 30-second mark, and I think we'll go into a little bit more detail here in a minute. So here's your burning rate. So every 30 seconds, you have an additional window that will be added. If the building has been cleared and it is safe, it will not reignite or increase its fire score. So you know, obviously there was, you know, some confusion around our, our game manual as it relates to fire prevention versus fire score. We've kind of gone away with fire prevention score. So really the way you should interpret this is that you're basically just trying to put out all fires in, in the field and you'll get scored based upon that. This is kind of a visual that you can expect to see today, right? So at the match start, you'll see one of your LED, a portion of your LED come on on two of your shorter buildings, and then 30 seconds expires, you'll see the right side of that LED panel light up. At the second minute, you'll see the fire move to the other buildings, right? So it'll, it'll progress and jump over the chute for, for our water tower and ignite your other two buildings. Another kind of visual representation, especially this would be valuable for your ABR pilot and, and whoever's supporting him or her, is that they all have, all buildings have a blue light on the top corner that blinks whenever you successfully hit it with a laser or drop your water balls into the top of the building. And that gutter, the gutter, the LED, will decrease as the water is added. Very simply, again, you know, instead of interpreting through fire prevention and fire scores, I think the really easy way to approach today is kind of a quantity, right? So if you are attacking a uh, building or a, a residential building or on, on the other side, and it is a laser target building, right? So you're going to have to hit that laser target 16 times to expire that building. And the same thing would reflect with an open roof building where you'll have to drop 16 balls into that building. So on the dormant side, there's a lot that it's a pretty dynamic side, right, to start the match out, as opposed to our fire side where we're really attacking primarily with our ABR drone. On the dormant side, you know, there's a number of things that are going on in, in simultaneity. So the tele recon path is going to be reflected with a blue LED strip on that dormant side. And this is a good representation of that path. I think you can fully expect to see a pretty consistent tele recon path today. So we're not going to kind of throw randomness at you or uh, give you different paths per se, but I think what, you can, what you'll see in your first match is pretty reflective of what you'll see throughout the next three. Obviously, this is going to be 
required to be done autonomously, A, if you want to get those autonomous points, but also if you want to reveal your fire spread paths early, right? So those trench locations that you'll be using your rover to push bean bags into. If you do not do it autonomously, so let's say you do it manually or your drone uh, skips a code and, or falls, stalls out or lands or falls out of the sky, then at the three minute mark of your match, we will reveal that fire spread path or those two trench locations that you'll be required to, to uh, uh, produce, use your rover to push those bags into. The, um, uh, so the trees on this dormant side, and I think that we'll I'll kind of triangulate between the fire side and the dormant side for this. So on the fire side, your AVR drone is the only, your only item that you can use to knock those trees or knock that forest over, obviously kind of using your prop bars to do so. On the dormant side, <coughs> only your Spiro minis can knock those trees over. Uh, with, you know, in certain days and weeks past, you know, there's been teams that have tried to use their rover to do this or utilize the Telos prop wash to knock them over. You're only going to get points, you're only going to get award points if you use your minis to knock over those trees. Another thing just to consider in terms of setting up and your setup time is where your Spiro minis must start. So uh, hopefully, you know, everyone is kind of taking a peek into our match area and, and kind of seeing kind of the layout with your game. On the fire station, there is a platform where your mates must start and they must roll down their fire chutes to kind of engage with the planning team. So phase two. Uh, fortunately, I don't think we got anyone to phase two yesterday. I, you know, I'm hopeful that we, there will have a few teams that can do this. Uh, but there's not going to be a hot spot that's going to ignite in phase two. And rather, you're just going to have a total of three active buildings that are going to ignite on that dormant side. And they're going to be kind of linearly aligned either on the, your far side or your close side in terms of how this layout is. As far as phase three, that's kind of a free-for-all phase, right? So you're going to kind of see a kind of a randomness of, of, of all the buildings in the entire match uh, space light up uh, at that point. And if we get somebody there today, that would be wonderful. So again, you know, the, kind of a little bit of a rush here. I know that you know all teams want to kind of cross their T's, dot their I's here as they're preparing for their first match. Uh, but I think largely, you know, I'm going to be present here all day in the match area as, as questions come up and you have issues that, that you want to get clarification on. Please feel free just to come over to me. I'm very approachable and uh, good luck to everybody.